me. Um, what I'd like to do now is to hand over to Tim. Tim is here, uh, he's the UK Commissioner, and he is going to take it from here. Tim, right, thank you. Morning, all. Right. So, uh, I'm, I'm Tim, the UK Commissioner. Like you, it's a voluntary role, so it, uh, it occupies my uh, spare time. And I suspect, just like you, that's an interesting concept. Where does spare time really is? Uh, it's a little bit busy at the moment, uh, as I'm sure this will be uh, with comments about a friend of ours, but also our response to the recent inquest and so on. So, it's, it's interesting to be able to come to a, uh, a meeting where we're really focusing on how we can together uh, do something really positive uh, with young people and with adults in scouting. And I thought that what I'd like to do is to sort of take us a step back and, and do a little bit of some history uh, to, to think about our journey with, with inclusion in scouting right from the word go. Last year I was in Scotland at an event called Scout Fest and they have a, uh, a, a museum there and I found some uh, headquarters notices from 1961. Uh, and there was one bit I came across and I couldn't resist it. So I transcribed some bits of advice from 1961, which sort of like a double-edged sword. Right? It's sort of saying we are thinking about how we include people. But there are a whole pile of interesting assumptions in this, which today might cause you all to take a deep intake of breath. So I'm just going to just show you what we were saying in 1961. Women and scoundrels. You now know we're on dodgy ground, right? We're already on dodgy ground. Uh, it's unusual that I'm known for a woman to hold a warrant as a scoutmaster of a boy scout troop. She possesses exceptional qualities and experience has shown she can successfully run a scout camp. It's good to know, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> if she observes the following proportions. <laughs> You just know what we're going through, don't you? You know what we're going through, right? Here are the precautions in 1961 for a woman who is already a scout master. So your own camps be quite separate from that of the scouts. You must avoid the scouts. I your presence at inopportune moments. All of your minds are just a minded when I read this. Stop it, very naughty. I said, what? No, no, that's okay. You're clearly going to need a maid to take charge at night. <laughs> and number four, you must not interfere with the responsibilities of children. So that's what was being said about women scout leaders in 1961. But it doesn't stop there. And I've missed a few bits out just for a minute. Wives at scouts. <laughs> you ready for this? Right, okay. Now, I missed out quite a lot of the preamble because I couldn't cope with saying it to people. But, you know, a scout may regard his wife as exceptional, the scouts might not. <laughs> if the alternative to permitting a scout's wife to be in camp is that the troop will have this own camp, then it's sort of okay as long as you follow these <laughs> principles. You ready for these ones? <laughs> So you still got to use the patrol system. So there's a hint there, isn't there? Which is, don't change things because your wife tells you. Right? <laughs> you must have a separate uh, camp uh, for the scout master and his wife. And there must be no interference in the running of patrol camps. Because yet again, apparently you wouldn't interfere. So some... <laughs> <laughs> this next one, I dread to click. Are you ready for this? <laughs> The wife will take no part in running the camp, but may assist with sick boys <laughs> or as a judge in things like cooking. <laughs> if you're requested to do so. The presence of other women are not permitted. <laughs> now, as I said, it's a bit of a double edged sword. I've been looking for a place where I could show this to you because it caused me to sort of fall on the ground when I read it. And, and I took photographs, so I just couldn't resist. And I thought, it, 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 there is an interesting side to this. Which is at the time and in the environment and in the sort of social environment at that point, uh, this was still doing some things that people thought shouldn't happen. Right? You know, women at scout camps, you know, women being scout leaders or scout masters as they were, that alone was an odd thing, unusual thing. Then to allow sometimes, and there's loads of advice. Reading this, the page, it just makes it increase to me. There's loads more advice about you know, how you might approach this, and you know, the district commissioners should, should look at this kindly, but make sure that the boys' fun is not interrupted, all this sort of stuff. 
as those, those tensions still exist today, not about women that come, but about anything that for us now is a little bit more unusual or a, 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 a difficult for people, we still have the same tensions that exist in the things we say and do. When we started Scouts, when I said, remember that Bacon had this view about being open to it's not a new statement. Uh, his realisation of that at the time, uh, particularly in the experimental camp, was about young people who have got a good start in life and young people who perhaps have less of a start in life and how could they work together. So it was one dimension of a range of dimensions that we uh, now look at. So right at the start, there was something happening. The first National Inclusion Committee was uh, started in 1936. So that's quite a while ago, had a different view of what inclusion meant and how we did it, but it was a started sort of way back. And then we had something sort of in the 1940s onwards that was called extension scouting. With today's eyes, it seems unusual. So it says, well, there's an extension to scouting where people who are different from the rest can, can do some scouting type stuff, but they'll do it separately. Uh, and, but, but it wasn't actually, you know, bad stuff, it was really good stuff that was done, huge amount of stuff that was done, and groundbreaking at the time. But the word extension scouting applied nowadays, I think we start to just twitch a bit when we think of that. Then the association said, well, we really want to make sure that uh, we are starting to include people who are different. Um, and at the time it did this, it, it used words that we would never use now. And I did put them on the slide because I think I can say it, but I, I would never write it up now. So we just have Assistant County Commissioners brackets handicapped, brackets off. You know, a, a word now that, that one just would never use in any circumstance, really, right? So, um, and what happened then was really interesting. It is interesting for us to think about it. It's the lesson that we, that we might learn from this. Because what happened in some places, quite a few places at the time, was that uh, the message was, we want to try and make sure that young people uh, with what we might call additional needs uh, are able to do their scouting. So we got this post we're going to invent to help that to happen. And what happened in a lot of places was something quite different. What happened is that the people with these positions uh, gathered to themselves the power and responsibility to deal with young people with additional needs. And in lots of places said, no, no, if, if a leader asked, no, you can't have that person, I'll look after that person. And actually took away from the groups the ability to integrate and do things. Not everywhere, in quite a lot of places. And it's a really interesting lesson to us is that how do we bring expertise, knowledge and ideas into the movement without, by doing that, it's separating what we're trying to achieve from the people that are doing it. And so there were some, there were some interesting side effects of this that were not um, so, so good or so easy to see. So we did that um, and, and now uh, people in workplaces and uh, in scouting talk about quality, diversity and inclusion. So EDI is used a lot. Now I am not an expert which I think is quite a good, good position to be because most of us are not experts. Many of you in this room probably are experts. Right? So you might be professional experts or you might be experts in the amount of work you've done in scouting. Um, so I'm not an expert. And I think many of our leaders are not. But we have to think about what does that mean to us if we're not experts, how do we, how do, we do this? Uh, and for me, the equality bit uh, is all about um, giving people the equal opportunity to, 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 to capitalise on the things we're doing. It doesn't mean everybody's treated the same, but they're given the right support so they can join in the same way, right? So that's, that's equality for me. Diversity is more or less a measure of um, the difference we have in our sections, in our scouting, you know, whether we reflect the community and so on. And inclusion for me is the work that we do to make sure that the environments that we have genuinely include people. So people don't feel they're there because there's a quota. People don't feel they're there because they're ticking a box. They feel they're there because they bring something to the experience and they learn from the experience and everybody's valued. And that's, I think, the same in the world of work. So one of the really key things, I think, for many of us is to have to do this really difficult step. We have to actually physically step outside ourselves and look at ourselves and see us as others see us. And that's really hard. It's a bit like saying, well, everybody knows me, I'm going to open to everybody, they can just come in the door. That's a world of difference from feeling if you're someone who's outside something that it is okay to walk in the door. And we're quite a lot of people. Just imagine for a moment if you were from Mars and 
you landed at the start of a cut-scan meeting and you watched people doing the grand pan, what would you think? Well, we take it for granted. Our left hand check, it's really odd, right? Even our, even our, even our, so we doing that with your fingers. You know, if you watch Beaver Scouts when they first try and do it, <laughs> I mean, adults don't need to move when they try and do this thing, right? It becomes second inch, just think it's normal. Right? All those sorts of things. And it is not right for us just to say that we're open to everybody. We have to physically show that and actually bring that to the other communities who think that they are not included. It is one reason, and a powerful reason for me, why uh, in our branding exercise, the logo change, which made it closer to the original that BP first drew as it happens, that the testing we didn't have told us that people who are not involved in scouting and have different uh, faith and beauty backgrounds saw that as being interesting. When they looked at our old one, it looked very heraldic. It looked like 12th century knights on missions in foreign countries. Uh, and people saw that and felt that and felt excluded by it. So it's interesting. We have to look at ourselves quite hard. So what we're trying to do with our inclusion now, we're saying for, for 2023 we've got a number of things we want to do. We want this diversity and inclusion stuff to be actually who we are and how we work and what we do. Not somebody over there saying you should do it, but us even think we do doing it. That's a, that's, a, that's a quite an interesting process to get to a state where we can all talk about it and we can all be this rather than someone telling us what we should do next. It's really interesting and quite hard to do. We want to make sure that what we do with young people, so the Scouts program, as we say here, is actually going to, I mean, we need to disrupt here, social inequalities for everybody, but for and with young people. So how can young people help to make sure that the world is more equal for everybody, that everybody gets an equal chance? How can they be part of that change as well? We want to make sure that all of us, as adult volunteers, actually feel empowered and supported to do this for every other person in our community, that it's okay to do it, which means we have to do some things a bit differently, we have to be a bit more flexible. And we want to uh, reflect the diversity of UK society, but we also want to make sure that I can bring myself, you can bring yourself, you can bring themselves to the scout experience and not feel they have to project a different version of themselves for some reason. And I think all that, I mean, it is brilliant, but it will challenge us in a number of ways as we think about it. So we've got some principles on which we want to try and achieve this vision, which starts to make some things a little bit more uh, real, perhaps. So first of all, it's always a to focus thing. So it's not just about equal access, but it's also about what we call our structural barriers. So it's truly uh, an equal experience. So, so for example, quite a bit of our rules uh, that have grown up over the years have been developed in, in situations which I think we probably sort of call sort of middle class sort of situations now. Uh, I went to visit um, some work we're doing in one of the more deprived areas in Bristol um, and they've started a scout group and I was going to see them. I think absolutely brilliant. They're right? doing really, really good, good work. But some of the stuff that we said he doesn't fit. So here's an example. Um, in, in, if any of your beaver scout leaders who know typically say, you know, at the end of a beaver scout meeting, no one leaves unless they've been a parent or carer. Right? So that's a good rule of thumb. Uh, in this area, 95% of them arrive without the adults. They walk themselves there at age five. That's how it is. You know, just, that's what happens, right? And so when we say you're not allowed out unless your, your mum's here or whatever, they just look at you like you're mad. So it's not their social experience. So some of our structures and some of the things we do. Don't fit different areas. We have to be prepared to think about that. And that's going to be that is quite challenging. But we want to make sure that we're led by the community, so that we're guided by diverse people. What we've done with a lot of our work we're doing in Broughton now, um, in quality of all our volunteer teams that are working on it, is we're saying, and we want some different people in them as well. People are steeped in scouting, absolutely. People are outside of challenges. People from different backgrounds, but so that when we look at stuff, we are challenged and thinking through. We want to make sure that we consult and collaborate with people, and we're talking about meaningful consultation. Uh, so that means uh, meeting people and talking to people from their perspectives on their ground, so you understand their, their reasoning. And then we want to make sure that if we make decisions, that we actually get through evidence rather than just, well, my gut feeling today is it really good, you know. So how are we going to make sure we've got some real uh, uh, evidence that we can make decisions based on? And the last thing is, we want to make sure that we do things but we evaluate it and are not scared to say we didn't get that right. We need to tweak this and change that. It's really important. 
So I think those things will help us to get in a, in a space where we're able to better um, realise our vision. So those underpin the work we're doing, and we've got some goals about this. We want to make sure it's training resources. So we've already started getting a few more local training resources out now. Um, and uh, this is being led by Bonte Greer Fulton, who happens to be uh, in Scotland, uh, and we're producing more resources now uh, around this whole area. And I just saw some last weekend that are on their way out soon, uh, where we'll be working with people to develop plans um, to help include young people with additional needs into scouting. A simple way of doing it that helps make it a positive experience for everybody, and um, they look really good actually. So there's more stuff coming. We want to make sure that we uh, really do widen this participation uh, of inclusion, that we've got this culture where everything we think and say and do and deliver is part of um, this inclusion aspect. We've got um, uh, a, a chap doing that, um, which is not my page, not my page. Go. Matt Pilling, who's an assistant district commissioner that happens, has been a section leader uh, for a long time with young people with additional needs, um, so uh, very practical, so we'll do more on that. Now we're going to make sure we extend our reach and build partnerships with other people um, so that we're able to genuinely reach into other areas. This is also being looked after by another one too, but Louise Madden, who has been an ADC and leader and so on. So some practical people who are helping us to do these things. So in terms of that, how does everybody fit together? So making sure we reach those three areas there. We've got lots of local inclusion leads um, going all over the place in different names and groups. We just put bucks about local inclusion teams. So there's lots of them include those people into their part of this scheme. We've got some headquarters staff and this is, we've got two, to be clear, but there's 160,000 of us adults out in the field. There are two headquarters staff to help us. Um, uh, an equality diversity inclusion manager, experience this area who's helping us uh, understand what we're doing, and a, a member support officer for inclusion. So we've got a bit of extra support and linking into the then, uh, if we look across the UK, there are, uh, at the country level, the nations, Northern Ireland and Scotland and Wales, and they have a system where they've got uh, uh, commissions for inclusion as well, we've got the UK commission for inclusion at all. And the last part of this team are young people and parents from all of our communities. Uh, we can't, we shouldn't be doing this to people, we should do this with people who <coughs> are engaged. So that's, that's the idea that we're going to do that. So we've got some resources. Um, there's been some uh, reasonable adjustment guidance uh, that's come out. You'll have seen some of that, particularly from uh, the uh, case from, uh, last year uh, around autism. And so we've done some more work on that. Um, and it, it's a tricky area, this reasonable adjustment stuff for people, because it comes with a sort of feeling of there's a bit of law behind this. Thing, so what if I get it wrong? What happens? You know, all that sort of stuff. What's reasonable? Um, so there's some, some work on that um, and some more to come. And also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, still about behaviour support. How do we support people dealing with various behaviours uh, in sections? For the support side, we're, we've got there's local support um, to help inclusion matters. We want to make sure we develop um, the confidence in this so that everybody feels confident to tackle all these areas and go into it, embracing it, and being able to support young people and adults um, in, in various ways. And we want to make sure that. One of the things we, we note is that quite a lot of our resources are like the world's best kept secrets. Um, if you happen to know it's there, it's great. If you don't know it's there, how do you get access to it? So we want to increase this awareness of our resources so that people know this stuff there to help us a bit of work to do there. On the training front, we've done some online training and webinars. There's been a whole pile of those going on over the last year or so. Uh, for the specialist modules, um, you know, in some data studies, uh, we're using this model of train the train. So let's train people locally to be able to run the modules so that more people can be access them. Um, and we're looking at reasonable adjustments, as I mentioned earlier on. We're looking at what autism ways because of the issues that popped up and people asked lots of questions about. Uh, and then mental health, uh, which we're seeing um, increasingly being discussed, and I think we should support it in other ways, um, both the young people and adults. So what have we done more recently? We've adapted the module 736. So they've just come out now. Um, so module 7 scouting 4136 is the next edition of module of inclusion. Um, and we also strengthen that. So some bit of stuff that's, that's come out there. They, they look really good through them the other day. Uh, it looks really good. So um, hopefully in the bucks, I don't think someone from training in bucks here will be doing, doing some of that sort of stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Thanks. Hey, David, thank you, David. I will second that. Yeah. Uh, and it's all about positively how we do things together, rather than 
Uh, so new resources, so there will be more guidance, so to develop, some stuff are developing more stuff, um, and some practical tools to help you with this reasonable adjustment stuff, which I think is quite, can be quite difficult at times. Uh, training, so we don't have a piloting of some more modules uh, for uh, mental health and autism awareness, and there will be more of that coming out, so we've got some more stuff uh, on the road, on the ground. And then how do we uh, celebrate our inclusion? Uh, so we're going to, to launch some new resources, which means that local inclusion volunteers can celebrate some of the people, because we should be proud of what we do. We should be proud of how we do things. And so, I suppose, there's always these questions about how can we be more inclusive. And I've just got a few points here that we've got in the various bits of new training that I've just pulled together. Some of the things we say to people about how we can be more inclusive. So the first off, it gets back to what I said earlier on. How do you show that a group is open to all? They've got to be proactive in that. You can't sit back and say, I've got a poster on the wall inside the scout hut, so that's okay. And you've actually got to reach out into communities, which means we have to feel a bit uncomfortable with all these. So we have to go and visit the different communities that we normally see and say, hi, I'm from the scouts, we're just, we're just down the road there, we'd love to see some real work and, and, and bring ourselves to them. Uh, we need to get to know the other people, parents, carers, and other volunteers. The, 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 I can't stress enough, I think, that knowing the parents, carers, uh, is really important, having a good relationship with them, particularly for young people with additional needs, that we're doing all the right stuff together. Uh, and that's not always easy, is it? Because we know that sometimes parents and carers are scared to tell us about additional needs of young people, because they think that we might then not want to deal with them. Uh, and my experience everywhere in scouting is that scouters take this as a challenge. If someone says, I can't do that, but I'd like to, we say, we can help you. That's what our leaders say. So, right. so, we've got to get over this not telling people something. It's really difficult if you're a leader and you think there's something there and I, and the, the, I can't understand what it is. You're at a step disadvantage, aren't you, for this? So, getting to know parents and carers and involvement is really important. Being prepared to ask open questions, you know, so what's best? Um, how, how do I do things? Tell me what will work. And be prepared to listen and take other people's advice. And, and particularly for those with a lived experience, accepting that they know less about this stuff, right? And talking to them about it. And thinking about how inclusive we are with our dates and our venues and the way we arrange things. Um, one of the things that I, I found really interesting, one of uh, my UK team is Muslim, um, and, and uh, so there are times when he needs to pray. As long as we know that at the start, we just arrange meetings so it works. If you don't do that, then it's really difficult to retrofit it because you now say, oh, well, we, got, we don't have time for that, which is really silly. So being upfront about it, putting things at the start, works much better. So it's, it, you just have to get used to that. But also, not making assumptions, actually allowing our young people to tell us and, and their, their parents and carers uh, to, to explain what works for them, I think is really important, and being open to that. And also, if they say, well, this doesn't work for you, not instantly saying, well, we can't change that, just reflecting before we apply and just so easy. And then everything in order everywhere is challenging unacceptable language and behaviour. Uh, and, and I do that, I get, I get as Scott Shaw's you do as well, get some astonishing emails from some people at times and some astonishing conversations I have. Uh, and I think we have to be prepared to say that's not how we do things. And I always root it in our scout values. Right? Because we've got a good set of values to talk about and to explain. <coughs> people can disagree which is great, because disagreement allows us to get better results in the end, and exploring the differences is really good. But let's do it in a way that is polite and pleasant to people, and it allows people to explore stuff. So, that's a very, very brief whiz through um, where I think we are at nationally. There's loads of stuff coming out and more, more to come. But it is important to say thank you. So, because for a start, thank you for coming today. You may have various reasons that you're coming today, um, but being here and being prepared to discuss things that might be a bit uncomfortable and learning about different ways of doing things is really important. So thank you for that. And thank you also for everything we do for the young people. Uh, I say often, and I genuinely believe this, that we are needed more today than we have ever been needed in our scout history. We see a world that is increasingly divided, increasingly fractious, uh, and we can help young people to heal that and to shape the world for the future to be better. We genuinely can. I think that's really important that we do it and do that in an inclusive, open, and heartfelt way. So thank you very much. It is now time to do some work.
Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.